want to make the, the, the packaging very appealing so the people can get a hold of the information you're holding inside. That's why I'm making these screaming thumbnails. Hey everyone, what's happening? I have a very special guest here today in the office. Actually, very first one in our new studio. MM Crypto, Chris. Man, how's everything going? Thanks for having me, man. Beautiful studio. I can't wait for the discussion today and to talk to this amazing audience. I know your audience. It's, it's cool. Yeah, we have uh, prepared a couple of uh, discussion points. Um, obviously, what's happening right now, how are we going to continue? Um, what are trends that we're seeing? And uh, yeah, our history actually goes back quite a while. Um, we have originally met in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to maybe start there and then we go on, yeah, what's happening right now? Let's yeah. discuss that a bit. Yeah, let's go to the controversial stuff later on. Um, <laughs> it was cool, man. I think I started as a moderator in your Facebook group. Yeah. Uh, actually, I heard about crypto way before I heard it, about it from you, but I heard about it only from like network marketing, MLM people. I was like, okay, I don't want to touch this. But I studied economics and once I heard you talking about it, it was like, hey, wait, that's what I was searching for because I was looking at gold and silver, but it was too boring. I was so young. So I got into it. I started as a moderator in your Facebook group and I invested and eventually we met at a meetup in Frankfurt, I think, yeah. 2017. I asked you, hey man, what do you think? Should I start my own YouTube channel? You said, yeah, come, go ahead. So I started and there we are five years later and um, both doing beautiful things in the space. I think a lot of people like today, right, when they hear that, and I think you have shared this a couple of times in your videos, and then people come to me and they ask me and they say, hey, what do you think about like Chris, like actually not being so much bigger than you as an influence and everything? I'm like, you have no idea how actually, like, I, I think proud is the wrong term, but it's like, you know, how happy this actually makes me because I always feel like the most powerful thing is if you actually inspire someone to do something and then, um, does it way bigger than Thank you, you man. Did. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. So I, and, and I mean, it's but not you only... are the bigger business person, man, for sure. Yes, you know, I, I think in the, in the company also, I mean, I've had people who left the company uh, to start their own business and they're doing really well, right? And mm -hmm. for me, it's the same thing. I think everyone, some people, they are just really kind of made for, I don't know, doing their own thing and others just really fit in to kind of work on something, so. Yeah, but it helped me. I mean, for sure, you inspired me not only with Bitcoin, but also with YouTube, right? Because you had a YouTube channel. I was like, hey, that's cool. So without you, the butterfly effect, I don't think I would have started a YouTube channel What was channel your decision you. in doing it in English? Because obviously that was for me what I didn't do. I did German and I never shifted away from that. You... I did start in German, actually. Oh, I didn't know. I did start in German. And then I thought, hey, um, I, sh I want to do English. And I remember how you said... I, I really remember this 2017 or 18, you said um, rather be the biggest fish in a small mm. one than um, a small fish in the big mm. one. But I thought, hey, I might as well be the biggest fish yeah, in the big right. ocean. Of course, it's a much more tough um, challenge, right? And I had to dedicate more focus and energy towards it. But it went well. Um, in the end of the day, having a very strong, I think you have the strongest German audience in the world. So that is a very powerful thing. Um, I just thought I want to reach everyone. It's like kind of also part of my purpose. I want to talk about Bitcoin. And I want to reach everyone in the world. And I thought English is the, the best way to go with that. Uh, but it was a risky approach because in the end, you might end up as a small fish in the big ocean. What do you think was, on the English one, the recipe to success? Was it the <gasps> thumbnails or do you think it's the thumbnails and the content? Is it either yeah. or? What? Do you think was the breakthrough? So what I, the advice I usually give to people, and it's it's huge advice. It's advice, advice I would have loved to have when I started because I did trial and error for a long time. And I don't think trial and error is necessarily the best strategy if you only go with that. The most important thing was for me to like just look at the peer group, the biggest ones, look what they are doing, like how are they doing their titles, how are they doing their thumbnails, what kind of content, uh, content is interesting for the people, what's their wording, how do they structure their introduction. So you remodel it, you take the best out of everyone and then you fuel it with your own soul. That's what I did. And then of course, once you do that, you do a little bit different. But when you look at the peer group and you remodel the best of everyone, you can basically take all of their trial and errors, all of their hardships and like big work they put in 
take it, take the working concept and then make it better because you already start from a higher position. So I think that was the, the, the biggest deal for me to mm -hmm. like remodel and then put my own soul into it, which is the thumbnails, the craziness, big faces, emotions, entertaining, the MM easy crypto content. style. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Have exactly. you thought about going to more, like I thought about this and then I decided against it, but going that like BitBoy, crypto kind of route where like having an actual studio, having an actual team, for me it was, I, I really kept that super lean where it was just me and one or two team members and that's it who helped me with some of the editing and helped me with some of the uploading. But I never really had a studio. I just wanted to keep this super nimble. Um, from everything that I see, you have this very similar. Did you think about having, like making an MM crypto kind of crypto studio with like 20, 25 people? Was that never on the table as much or how did you see that? So far not, but I have it in my back head. I mean, right now I'm having it as lean as possible. Like something like this never existed. I only have my phone. I just travel around. I make the videos on my phone. I don't edit. I upload on my phone. I do Twitter on my phone, Telegram. Everything goes from my phone. So it's the leanest business model ever, I think. But it's also just very fitting to my current lifestyle. I like to travel around, but obviously now being above 30 years old, Eventually, I want to settle. I want to have children, family, right? More chill. And once I do that, I will adapt my business model mm. to that. And I really think I will have a studio. I will have employees mm. and um, have it a little bit different. So the channel is always a little bit the mirror of my lifestyle. So now a little bit more loose. But as I get more settled and 2023 might be the start of that, um, I will change a little bit hmm. my business model as well. I mean, I tell you, uh, there's two lives, uh, one before kids, one after kids. I <laughs> tell you already, I have no idea. I didn't uh, think that when I had my first kid, how that changed everything. Yeah, I, I, I heard it firsthand from many people, but also it makes you so much happier. So I think it's, it's a price you want to pay, right? A little bit more stress, a little bit less time, but the happiness and fulfillment is good. Sometimes. <laughs> I, know, I know, yeah. Um, Can be rough. You, just like me, I mean, yeah, we have experienced 2018, then now it's 2020, a lot of people draw kind of comparisons. Um, I think majority of the crypto investors actually experienced for the first time a bear market, just because actually the majority of crypto investors now came in in 2020, 2021. Um, how do you experience 2022 different or the same as 2018? Well, in the end, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. If we just look at the chart, it looks very similar. So it's the same story in just different words. Uh, we still had bankruptcies in 2018. We still have had a lot of failed projects in mm. 2018. Now everything is just at a much bigger scale, right? I mean, FDX, the financial damage in, in US dollars is so much higher than Mt. Gox in 2013 or than Cryptopia in 2018 or whatever. Yeah. So. In the end of the day, I think the same things are just repeating in like a little bit of a different wording. Um, some things are different though. So I just made a video about it yesterday. If you go on the, on the weekly time frame, Bitcoin is actually still in a channel of a 12 year support and 12 year resistance. I can show you maybe after the video, or maybe we can, we can overlay a picture here. Uh, so from that regard, it's not really different. And every single time in a bear market, we have like a trend line which suppresses the price until we eventually break it towards the upside. But here now are all the different things. For the first time, we broke below the previous all-time high, something I didn't expect. I don't know if you expected it. You're not the biggest Bitcoin fan anymore, maybe, but... No, no, I, I, the... I, I am a Bitcoin fan. Yeah? I, I, yeah, I just... Okay. Yeah, no, no, Good. I am a Bitcoin I'm fan. I'm happy. No, no, <laughs> I am a Bitcoin fan. I, the com I mean, our company has the majority of the crypto treasury in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I, I am. Uh, I... I we can discuss this a bit but yeah of course of course let's come to that later but like many things are different we broke below the previous all-time high but honestly this doesn't make me any bearish right now i mean it was the same thing 2018 when everyone was bearish on bitcoin we went to 3150 us dollars okay i thought 6000 would have been the bottom and then we had this one last breakdown to 3000 but who cares? I mean, now we are at 16,000, 15,500 was the bottom. I don't really care if we break down to another 12,000. FDX was the big black swan event. So now if we have another two, three medium size exchanges failing, the bang will not be as big as FDX. I think the biggest damage is already done. We already retraced 77%. So you think that? You think there's no more? Well, maybe, maybe. Like if, if we have, even if, if 
any other big exchange would be failing as long as it's not Binance or something, which I don't think it's going to happen. I think Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance. I think these are the they three are that safe, are, yeah. if one of those fails, I think that's really a they, trust Because they system. seem so safe, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but FTX seemed so safe as well. So you never know. So, But if, if one of these three fail, I think that would be another similar size I, black swan. I event. do think, though, on FTX, there were always like these rumors and stories that there was some dodgy shit going on, right? Yeah. It was just that no one believed them. But I think of all the licenses correct. And stuff, right? But I think on, I think sometimes you hear this with Binance, but then Binance is such super large, and you have actually no hard evidence. Whereas on Alameda and FTX, you always everyone knew, like really everyone knew that there was some weird stuff. But everyone thought that this was actually profiting them. Everyone, I think, from the experts, right? When you look at this, everyone is just shocked. What a moron you have to be in actually yeah. to lose so much money with all this inside information. I think that was more the issue, right? Yeah. Whereas Binance. You don't really have that Coinbase because they're so regulated, Kraken because they've just always been the leader with proof of reserves and all that. Mm -hmm. That just would be the shocking part to me. Um, yeah, but Kraken, I, I mean, I'm not promoting them, but I think they are the safest. Like they, they never got hacked. They are, they are so safe. That would be a huge surprise for me. But yeah, just as you said, if one of these ones fail, we will have another leg down. I personally think the biggest damage is done. 77%, 78% retracement. Uh, everyone is bearish right now. Everyone expects the price to go lower. So I don't think there are so many people left to sell. Um, but then in the end of the day, who am I to predict this? Because I didn't predict FTX, even though I never promoted it. I don't think it. anyone did, yeah. Never had an account on that, but I just didn't see do you it coming. See, do you see a difference in that 2018 for me was... So I'm someone who doesn't believe in a the cycle theory. Now I understand we had this is the third cycle, but I actually don't believe in a the cycle theory in a sense where... Uh, in 2014, 2018, 2022, we always had a setback, even though we did. <laughs> but I think it was for completely different reasons. And so 2014 was because of Mt. Gox. 2018 was because the entire ICO bubble bursted. And 2022 was because of the entire global recession. That's how I see it, right? So because it was those three different events, and here's also what I actually think. I think we would have never seen so quickly and so aggressively an all-time high had it not been for all the money printing in 2020 and then 2021. So I, again, maybe we're fooled by randomness that we have just three data points and we immediately start charting graphs and starting, like, because we're humans, we love to have these connections. And I sit here and I'm like, hmm, I don't want to say this time is different, but maybe it is a little bit different. I don't know how, if, if you actually think there's a, just, like, macro doesn't have so much of a play here in... in in, in, in Bitcoin or crypto? No, yeah, you have a good point. If you just have three data points, statistically, it's not significant at all, right? I mean, in statistics, usually if you, if you go and you make a poll, you need like 200, 200 people participating to have statistical significance. But um, in the end of the day, we have cycles in every market, in the stock market, sure. right? We have cycles. And in the end of the day, they always crash for the same reason, just because after some time you have an, reached an overvaluation, which is that much that it just has to come back. So I think that is the common denominator. We had overvaluation in like 2017, uh, we had it in 2021, and we had to just go down. And all of these things like Mount Gox and stuff, they might be the trigger, but I don't think they were the cause of the bear market. The cause of the bear market is just because it's a law of nature. Mm. It has to happen. Mm. We have Exa exaggeration to the upside, exaggeration to the downside. And I think this is the common denominator and the cause of bulls and bear markets. And things like Mt. Gox, FTX, um, and all of these things, I think that's just, just, that's just the trigger for the inevitable to happen. Do you feel one difference that I see a bit is in 2018, what collapsed was the speculation around projects where people just invested in startups, and, and a lot of these startups just collapsed, right? Which is totally normal. And then some of these startups turned into very valuable projects like today, like Binance at the end came actually out of this entire kind of hype, right? To, in 2022, sure, we had like Luna collapse and we had a lot of DeFi projects that like got completely pulled. But because of, for example, FDX and like Celsius and BlockFi and in Germany, Nuri, and then, I know, here in Singapore, Vault, Hodlnot, like a lot of, companies that actually people used and they thought, oh, like these are great companies. There's now this, like this, this trust from like retail to who thought I'm doing everything right, where they thought, oh, you know, yeah, I'm getting my 6% and I, it's a black box. I have no clue how it works, but let me still trust them. 
Do you think that that is a bit different, that it's going to take a little bit longer to get that trust back? Or do you think it just, like, people will forget they have such a, like, their short-term memory is, like, not, it, like, it, it is not the key thing anyways. They, they're just going to forget and they're gonna, there's going to be something new. Or how, how do you see that? I, both. I think it will take time to get the trust back, but people will eventually forget. I mean, FTX was not the first one. It was the 20th exchange yeah. or something. We had Mt. Gox, Cryptopia. Um, yeah, what, bit what stamp. Like, I mean, we, Bitfinex, we, we, I mean, I don't know how many have been we had yeah, issues. So, but no, we had like literally bankruptcies, so many literal bankruptcies in, in exchanges and FTX just being the biggest one of them. Um, so I think it will take time. All the exchanges now have to come out. They have to show proof of funds that they are not messing up with uh, user deposits. Whatever exchanges may be moving funds before their proof of funds or not even providing proof of funds, they will probably eventually lose trust, even though they will, some of them will not go bankrupt. But eventually, once the trust is like somehow reinstated, time will heal the wounds, and I think people will just forget, which is a sad thing. They should not forget, but they already forgot. I mean, who in the world was, everyone said, not your keys, not your Bitcoin by 2021. Who was really taking it so serious, yeah. even though they knew what happened with Mount Gox in 2013? People just forget. Yeah. But How did you manage that? I mean, for me as, a, as an influencer, and I don't see myself as much as an influencer, but for me as an influencer, it's very easy because I promote my own business basically, right? But you then, you have these affiliate deals with many platforms and you've done, like, as far as I know, a fantastic job in actually picking platforms that have all kind of weathered this really, really well, right? And let's hope they all keep doing Hopefully, this. Yeah. yeah. And how have you done that? I think that's key, right? Because I see so many, and especially in the U.S. markets. I mean, I expect a lot of class action lawsuits, especially in the U.S., right? With BlockFi and Celsius, mm -hmm. where a lot of people are going to go against these large influencers. Um, I hear this already in Germany, right? Where, like with Nuri, there's a lot of people who promoted Nuri. Nuri, and I, I, I know for a fact that there's people who are actually going to go for class action lawsuits there. So how have you managed to pick and choose well um, I think there's always some luck involved, 100%. I, I think especially with FTX, for example, right? But how did you kind of navigate that and, and manage that? Yeah, for example, FTX, it was so difficult to predict, right? Um, I never promoted FTX. I never had an account on FTX. Um, I think it was, on FTX, it was luck. It was luck and a little bit of my gut feeling, maybe, also uh, not to promote them. I need luck, but yeah. On the other exchanges, I was usually very uh, cautious. I got approached from uh, some exchanges in their early stages and I didn't promote them. And then I waited a little bit until their volume was very big, until I saw, okay, their trading engine is working and um, that I can say, okay, with a high degree of certainty, that's a safe player. So I, for example, now Binance, I have also partnership with Binance just recently signed because I think maybe that's the safest bet. However, I think caution is the most important thing after FTX went down. I actually stopped promoting anything, not even Binance, right? Whereas I think it's probably one of the safest ones because they just have like amazing profitability, right? And where there's profitability, they can always serve user, user withdrawals, which is the most important factor for, for, the, um, secure, for the safetyness of an exchange. So I think the most important thing is to be cautious, and um, I'm now being overly cautious. After yeah. this happened with FTX, I removed all the links. I told people, hey, every money you have on e either an exchange I ever promoted or another exchange, just withdraw it. If you don't, if you don't want to trade it in that exact moment, just withdraw it from the exchange. I stopped promoting any exchanges, and until the exchanges are not coming out and showing definite proof of funds, I'm not going to continue with that. So. Yeah. Um, for me, money is not the most important thing. Not even reputation is the most important thing. I just want to make sure that my followers are safe, right? And that yeah. they, they watch content which is, which is safe for them, even though everyone is kind of responsible for themselves. Uh, I don't want to like, lead people into a wrong direction. So caution is very important on that regard, I think. Yeah, 100%. I, I mean, completely agree. And, and, and I do want to say, I mean, uh, for us as a platform, because we only do yield, there's no exchange, we have such an easier time in showing that transparency. But for exchanges, it's really, really not that easy. Um, and I, I think most people just don't understand that. So even like these concepts with uh, Merkle proofs, for example, where you go and you prove the funds via the leaves and that all add at the end to a root. The key trick, and people really need to understand that, that's, for example, why Binance gets criticized so much for their Merkle proof. 
what they could do is they could make one leaf that has a massive negative balance and that just becomes one account. So if all the accounts get added up, then the balance, the, the root on top can actually show a lower number and all the people who add their funds together actually think, oh wow, yeah, yeah, Binance is doing everything right. But then there's this one account that just subtracts an entire kind of asset mm -hmm. number. And so that's just really, really, really difficult for exchanges to really prove. And so I just wanna like really highlight for people who really understand the cryptography behind it. And, and we have done so much work on that from the very beginning. For us, again, way easier. I don't wanna even compare that how difficult this is for exchanges. But so I know these issues. And so it's gonna be interesting. How many exchanges are gonna go out, right? Who are actually gonna prove, like provide Merkle proofs, gonna have a proof of funds, they're gonna provide the hash and you're gonna sit there and yeah, let's add this all together. And you're like, oh yeah, great, checks out. And then you realize, holy crap, like they completely lied to me. How did this, how was it possible? And it is possible because they can, in the Merkle proofs, one of the leaves can be a massively negative number. And so when a CC posted that on Twitter where he said, ah, we're coming up with Merkle proofs, Chessy from Kraken righteously came out and challenged CC on that and say, hey, without actual audit on the numbers, what you're actually providing as leaves on the bottom, like either you publish the leaves, which is completely problematic because then you publish all your account data, which yeah. is not good, or you have someone who actually looks at that, it's very difficult to believe you if that root at the end makes sense. But then I, I want to understand, that. because for me it will be important to see this proof and to take it as like granted proof. What do you think is the best solution? Merkle tree plus like KPMG audit or? Sure, so if I have a KPMG audit, at the end it's actually, I, I just need to have, I, I actually I don't even need to have what Binance is doing right now, which is they like, Actually, I mean, at least CC is saying that, right? I'm just taking him at face yeah. value. I'm not challenging him or commenting. It's just what CC is doing. What CC is doing is says, I'm going to provide the Merkle tree and I'm going to have the root at the, at the top. And on top, I'm going to have some audit firm to go through everything and audit everything. I actually don't think that that's necessary. All you need is you need someone to look at all the leaves. And so what you would have to look for so the leaves are the, in, in cryptography, are the, the ends at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. So you would just need to have an audit firm to sort the leaves from smallest to biggest. And then what you don't want to have is you don't want to have a very negative number in there. Because the negative number basically subtracts from all the assets that people have. And you have this one negative number, unless it's an actual account. I mean, it could be that someone, that you actually owe someone money. It mm -hmm. could be, I mean, it would be a massive problem, but it could be. And then... That's actually what the audit has to be. So someone has to look at all these numbers and say, yeah, in the leaves, there's no significant or material negative number. That is what's actually coming out as the root. So that's correct. And here are the addresses that we control. I think what Binance is doing right now with like sending millions of billions of dollars back and forth, I honestly don't understand why they're doing that. They would just have to go create all signatures, sign whatever, use the mm -hmm. latest Bitcoin hash on the, on the block, sign those publish the proof of that together with the Merkle tree proof, have someone that for this, you need an external auditor to just confirm that none of the leaves is a large negative number. Actually, that would solve most of the issues. It's very difficult to bypass then the, the biggest problems. As soon as I go and I try to create audits for all my account, look, we as a company did PCOB audits. It's the highest standard of an audit. That's the same as Coinbase has to do. Coinbase mm -hmm. has to do it on a quarterly basis. We did it on an annual basis and we underwent this entire audit. It's so incredibly difficult, right? It's so tough to do. And again, I'm not sure how complicated Binance's business is on the back end, but so it's just difficult then if this audit comes out and there's a reservation in the audit, right? If it's, it's called a qualification. So if there's a qualification in the audit, suddenly this entire audit is worth nothing anymore. So for example, we had a qualification for our 2019 numbers. We didn't care because it was our first year and the business we did in the first year, literally no one is going to care if these numbers are correct or not because they're so tiny in comparison to the actual business. You yeah. know, No one says, oh yeah, maybe you didn't have those $2,000 or not. It was just impossible for us to reproduce the evidence because yeah. that was at the beginning, right? And you don't really pay attention to everything, right? No one is going to challenge whether we had $2,000 extra or not. No one cares. But if it's about billions of dollars, that's where it matters. So. I don't know, I, I would assume the best and easiest way to do it is provide the Merkle tree and have an audit that all the leaves at the bottom are not a significant large negative number. That's all you need. 
then provide where the funds are in the blockchain, have them signed, use something that's very random, like a Bitcoin hash, I don't see how the attack vector on, on this would be. And I would assume the audit on this is super simple because all you need is someone to actually go through the hash here and see, oh, there's no negative number that subtracts from all the assets. Yeah. That's exactly the route we are going yeah. and, and what I think makes the most sense, right? So, yeah, because otherwise, let's see. I mean, I, but again, maybe Binance has a better idea. I just think that what Binance is doing right now is a bit of an overkill. Um, yeah. Moving billions of dollars around to prove that you own the address, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know that they are doing that now. Yeah, I mean, but CC has been posting on Twitter that like, oh yeah, if we're, if you're seeing a lot of fund movement before, that's a bad sign, right? I remember he said that. He said like, no, uh, he, if you if you see a big movement of no, funds no. before the he says, so if you see a, a big movement right now on our accounts, don't be alarmed. This is like purely for the cryptographic proof. Ah, uh, no, he said something else also before. Yeah, on the other against, exchanges, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So again, I really, I don't want to say that CC is doing something wrong here. I actually don't think so. I think they're doing a bit of an overkill. Yeah. It's just my gut feeling from it. And yeah. maybe it is because they don't fully understand how to actually prove it. And I also think, again, for us, for example, way easier to prove than for an exchange that has a lot of leverage built up, right? Not like they build it up, but like where customers build up the leverage. Yeah. So how do you kind of display that? How do you display the liabilities there, the assets? We don't have any of that, right? So if you have only spot and every coin actually has to be used for what it is, there cannot be any repurposing, 10 times easier. Yeah. So I may speak from a very kind of easy horse where someone else is 100 times. Mm -hmm. what, let's talk businesses. What do you think, which companies are still okay? Still, not, not from a like solvency perspective, but which business, let's talk business. Which business do you think in crypto is still making money. Maybe they're not cash flow positive right now because like they're hiring or they're, their marketing is aggressive, but like, let's talk about which business is still producing revenue. Well, I don't have a perfect overview of the whole market, but I'm very sure that exchanges are, right? Because not only spot, spot derivative futures exchanges, they- But then Coinbase, they I mean, they're always like very profitable. burning money like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, but Coinbase is very regulated and they are not like, I think they are not, not taking all the opportunities which they are in the open market because of their regulational boundaries. Mm. Um, but Binance, Bybit, like all of these exchanges, I think they are still very profitable. Uh, if I'm just going on coin market cap and checking their spot and derivative volume, um, it looks like they should be still very profitable. Let's take Binance, for example. Now in the bear market, compared to the bull market year, they actually, I think they kept their volume or even increased it within the bear market. It's like mm -hmm. almost impossible. Their US dollar volume, not Bitcoin volume. So if Bitcoin goes down 75% and you, have, you need to four times your volume <laughs> in Bitcoin to keep the US dollar volume, and they did that. So I think they are still highly profitable, actually incredibly profitable. If, to ha if I had to guess their valuation, it's a private company, I would say it's in the hundreds of billions already. Hundreds of billions for sure. Like I, I would guess like, I don't know, 500 billion or something because they had, really? they had trillions of volume. Trillions of volume. At 500 billion, I don't, I mean, that is. Yeah, 500 billion. They had trillions of volume. We could pull yeah, up no, no, market I mean, I'm cap not, and, I, I, and like, I'm just running the numbers. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, they make money with, um, and I don't know if they have internal market makers or not, but potentially you can make money on the ABC order book, on the spread, on uh, liquidations. You don't really make money. It goes into an insurance fund, but this money will not stay there forever, right? Then on fees, then also with your investment arms, if you are listing a project, mm. you they can take like 2%, 5%, 10% of the supply. Get the and by just listing them, it increases the valuation of the project. They just invested in pre-listing and pre-announcement and everything. So like all of these things, they they just, they were incredibly profitable in the bull market. And if, if some of the things I mentioned are not profitable at the moment, at least the trading they are offering their, their, to the customer spot and um, leverage like derivatives, futures. This is still profitable, especially if you look at the volume. So they are, they are highly profitable. I mean, Binance, I'm, I'm sure they are. Like if I had to choose the most profitable company in whole crypto, I would choose Binance. 
actually even like worldwide they are in the tops. Yeah, I mean, I also, I think if I could own one business, uh, obviously aside of my own, um, and I could just flip and choose, then obviously I think finance would be the But that would add to stress to your life. <laughs> you know that, right? I a lot of never, stress. I mean, I would never be able to run, I, I, I actually believe I wouldn't be able to run Binance. I mean, if I just see what CC is doing, I don't know if CC has kids, I, I don't know, but like it's incredible. as much as he travels and how much like, I, I don't know, I wouldn't want that, to be honest. I, yeah, it's, it's insane. He's traveling yeah. like multiple times per, per week sometimes. Yeah. Do going to all different countries, getting licenses, shaking hands, networking, conferences. Yeah. It's incredible. He has like five minute meetings scheduled in his calendar. Dude, I, I always like say the same thing. It's like you can have anything as long as you're making the sacrifices. And I think yeah. like people like would love to have certain things. They're not willing to make the sacrifice. And in this case, I mean, I would never make the sacrifice that CC is making right now. I, I wouldn't. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I also think the same amount if you if you look at Elon, for example, right? I mean, so many people are like, oh, Elon, like, dude, you would never want to have the trade-off that he's making. Like, that hate, that pressure, that stress, 20-hour days, and so people would not be willing to, to yeah. live up with that. Yeah, yeah, Elon is also a beast. I think now he's going into a battle with Apple. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Like I, I yeah. thought, okay, Twitter, he won, right? <laughs> yeah. Now he's going for Apple. What's the next? Amazon or what? I'm, like What I don't understand, though, is, I mean, I didn't want to tweet that because I, I don't want to kind of rattle or something yeah. him out. But I don't understand how on the Tesla app, right? So if on the Tesla app, you can buy subscriptions. And you buy them on the app. You have to fill in your credit card data and so on. Yeah. How is that not falling under the App Store? I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I always felt like, but then I, I'm like, ah, maybe they have like a separate kind of arrangement, right? But then on Twitter, the $8, he's complaining that he loses 30% to Apple. But on the Tesla app, that's actually not the case. And I also need to download it and I don't know. What do you mean? So, okay, so on the Tesla app, right? So like on, on the car, you need to pay certain subscriptions. There yeah. are certain things you yeah. have to pay for on a monthly basis. Oh, you have a Tesla, right? Yeah. yeah. So you always need to kind of go in there and you need to like, Pay for that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go through the app store. Of course, no, no. But but the rule, as far as I understand, right on the on the apps that you download from the app store is if you download the app from the app store and there's a payment in the app, yeah. you need to pay thirty percent to Apple. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think Tesla is doing that. Tesla is not doing that. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we don't know. Maybe they are. Yeah, but then it would surprise me that Elon is so surprised about the thirty percent fee that he has to pay for Twitter Blue to Apple. Yeah, but what if you what I, if you do it on the on the desktop? Then it's fine. Right. But but the Tesla, I mean, I'm sure I can do it also on the desktop. But it's very uncomfortable. I mean, people don't yeah, do it. Yeah, don't do it. No. Yeah. I so I, I just because like as far as I understand, Apple threatened to deplatform Twitter not because of the free speech stuff, but because Twitter was not willing to pay thirty percent. Are you sure that's the reason? Not sure, but. Yeah from the conversations that I've seen on Twitter, about Twitter, it was yeah. that I mean, direction. If, if that would be the case, I think, and that's the, uh, the terms, terms and conditions they subscribe to, I think Apple would be on the right side. But by default, I would just assume that Apple is not on the right side and <laughs> Elon is on the right side. But um, now that you are saying that that would make more sense, I think if, no, if that's what they subscribe to, they should pay the 30%. Yeah, oh, okay. I mean, if, if that's what they subscribe, if you agree to something, if you give your word, you shake yeah, hands Yeah, but because the entire discussion then is that Apple like kind of rattled around like getting all these companies in who are also against paying 30% to Apple. And then, I don't know. I mean, for me, it looks like that since, since Elon Musk took over Twitter, that he's getting a lot of backlash. I mean, many companies stopped advertising on, on Twitter. I think... Many companies, and I don't know if Apple is part of it or not, they don't like that free speech is pushed so much on, on Twitter. I mean, I'm still on that narrative. Maybe you can convince me, but uh, I, I'm still on that narrative. I, they don't like that he's giving platform back to many people who were banned yeah. before who are talking unconvenient things. I, I would right? say it's not even about free speech. It's about he's actually giving, like he, he just gives, he become, makes the platform center again. I think that's the key thing. Yeah. Because if you but were... That's beautiful, right? I 100% agree. Because before, if you were leftist, you had like... didn't matter. Like, you had free speech. Yeah. The problem was if you were centered. I'm not even talking about extreme rights. Like, it's not the point. But if you were centered, 
I think there was just a lot of things. That was already a problem. Of yeah. course. Like, I think that was the issue. And I think yeah. that's what he's giving free speech back to. And I think that's what he gets a lot of pushback for. Yeah. But I, as far as I understand, right, from everything that I've kind of read about this subject right now, the issue, the threat of being deplatformed for Twitter, uh, for, yeah, for Twitter, has nothing to do with that free speech issue. It's more on the eight dollars. And but Elon, in his the, like creativity, the way he spins it, is he spins it's like it, a big marketing gag. And sure, he says, "Hey, you guys want to charge me thirty percent of my eight dollars? I'm already losing billions of dollars a year on this, and now you're kind of charging me another thirty percent on that. Don't you like free speech?" I think that's yeah. how he's spinning it. Yeah. Would be smart, right? Because oh, it's the right way. It already looks like in like one year in the future he wants to release his own phone with yeah. Twitter on it. Yeah. So that would be the the right first marketing. If he move. does that, then that's gonna it's gonna be crazy. Yeah. 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 It's gonna be crazy. I will buy it. I don't know if it's. Uh, I would just it's, support it's it. It's unlikely you know? to be better than an iPhone. There's so much research and development in yeah. that. Like, it's a beautiful device. But I'm just gonna buy it. Just, <laughs> it's gonna be funny. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so like he's. It's like he's he's making his own simulation, and we are all living in his simulation. What I I agree. What I always love about him is that you know at that level, how he can still have that sense of humor, that that yeah. that these jokes. I mean, just walking into the Twitter headquarter with the sink, <laughs> like you know, I I don't know, like who does that? You know That's what I mean? So funny. Who does that? The only thing which was funnier was these two ex employees standing with the. Did you see that in front of the Twitter office? Yeah. This was the only thing which was topping it. <laughs> Like, I have to go back to my husband and wife. <laughs> it was so good. These two guys were geniuses. It was so funny. Mm. Wow. That ah. was a funny year today. Thanks to Twitter. It <laughs> gave me a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, let's see how that turns out. How do you yeah. think 2023 is going to turn out? What do you think? What are, uh, like, obviously 2022 is getting to a close soon. Um, For crypto, I, you mean? Yeah, general. Like, what do you think? What are the things you're expecting? What are things that are going to happen? What are you paying attention to? I mean, price-wise, if we just look at the market and we look at the past performance, I know you're not a big fan of that, but let's look at the halvings. We have had a halving in 12, 16, 20, uh, 20, 20 in May, 20. and I think the next one is scheduled to be in April 24. Yeah, March, actually, March. But it can, yeah. be, it can be March, it can be May. Mm. You, you never know exactly, right? It's, because of the, the, the block speed, but on average it should be 10 minutes and then it's gonna be March or whatever. So usually we find the bottom, of course, well in advance of the halving. So I would say if we didn't find the bottom now, I think in the next few months we will find it. And it's not gonna mm. just go straight up. I think it's gonna be a little bit dry, a little bit boring, but slide up what's market over the many, many months. Um, so I think overall, December uh, 2023 will be a green candle, a green yearly candle. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, but it's it's not going to be the most exciting one. But I think it's going to be a green yearly candle. Just looking at the past performance and at the cycles, this is what we should see. But then there are so many exogenous factors. Are other exchanges going down? What's going to happen with the U.S. dollar index? How is the um, how are the the interest rates performing? So all of these things are very difficult to predict. Then we have wars. We have the, the election, right? Many things very hard to predict. So price-wise, I still think it's going to be a green year because I see the market to be close at the bottom, close to the bottom or at the bottom. And then other than that, trend-wise, hard to say. I think NFTs can have a comeback maybe, right? Because, uh, I mean, they, they completely crashed and rightful so. I mean, it was just pushed on every mainstream influencer, pushed it but they also crashed down 95%. So I still see a good use case there. I think NFTs might be coming back. DeFi is always going to be big. So I see DeFi coming back for sure because it's just an incredible use case. Decentralized finance is something every single person needs. Yeah. So um, that Bitcoin, and of course- What do you think Bitcoin needs? Bitcoin needs? Yeah, what, what do, you do you think? Mean? Like what does it need to- It needs a lot of time. Right? Bitcoin needs a lot of time. Not necessarily anymore for like regulatory approvals, uh, approval because it already has pretty much approval everywhere. Um, but it just needs time for adoption, for, um, for widespread adoption, for the market to be cleared out, for the bear market, for people to be shaken out of the market. So I think it all takes a little bit more time than we thought and than we wished. I thought the last bull market would have been the top of 200,000 US dollars, it was just 64,000. 
So I think it doesn't really need so much. Bitcoin is a crack and it's decentralized. It's, it's taking over everything by itself just because of its decentralized nature. After time, we will get more and more merchants. We will get more and more countries or governments approving it as an asset. Um, implementing it in the implementing system. Implementing it. Um, I mean, I know you don't, you, you are not so pro lightning, but lightning takes also much longer than we thought so far, but potentially this has a potential in my opinion in the future. So this will also take a little bit more time. So I think all Bitcoin needs is just time. Whereas other things like um, centralized projects, they need development, they need marketing. Bitcoin just needs time. Do you think this, do, do you think we're gonna see ever another coin taking number one spot? Do you think Bitcoin will always hold that? Do you think, I don't know, maybe Ethereum or maybe something else? If, if anything, Ethereum, but I still think Bitcoin is gonna stay the number one. But if, if anything, I would say Ethereum. Because I, I believe in network effects, right? Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, of course, you can. There are many people who are coming out and they talk about like, okay, MySpace was so big, they had all the network effects. But you can't really compare that. Bitcoin is at a point right now where I think it will be very difficult I to to, to to get on top of that. And I think Bitcoin will keep ranked number one. And if anything, if I had to bet on anything else, I would say Ethereum, and just for the same reason, I network agree. effects, and. Um, has the biggest development community, uh, has a lot of apps running on it, and um, I agree. And the especially the two kind least, of least, uh, the, the most decentralized platform compared to like and it has Solana and all everything. Web three and DeFi, which both on Ethereum are very yeah. very strong, and to me these are the two kind of killer depths, if you want to call it, that this ecosystem has seen. Yeah. So Ethereum, yeah, um, I agree. I have like ninety percent of my portfolio is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. Even more than ninety percent now in the bear market. Yeah. I have to check, but it's 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 most of my portfolio. Yeah, um, like let me I I give you my like you mentioned that uh, I sometimes come across and actually a lot of people I think actually believe I'm not a Bitcoin fan. I'm um, actually so here are I thought so. I just heard last week I heard something else. Okay, so I believe people invest into Bitcoin for completely the wrong reasons. And because they do, their investment decisions are horrible. Um, like People have invested in Bitcoin as an inflation protection. But the reason this doesn't really work, in my opinion, is because it's not tested for that. People don't trust it well enough. They don't understand what's actually happening. There's a very small group right now that trusts Bitcoin. The majority of money, the majority of people don't, right? They, they don't. If I know that people think if there's a war, money will go into Bitcoin. It's very unlikely. If there's a world war, the majority of money will still go into do into dollars and into gold. Why? Because that's what people are used to. Sure, there will be some of the Gen Zs and Gen Ys who are like, ah, oh, screw the gold, screw the dollars, I'm gonna go into Bitcoin. Sure, but is that really the large amount? Maybe, I don't think so, right? So I don't see that part so much. Then this payment narrative. I have, really, I. You can read Cryptocurrencies Simply Explained. I published that in 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, that book actually talked about why Bitcoin is very unlikely to ever be a currency. And I, I'm just actually going to publish this video. You mentioned this about Lightning. Lightning is the best lie that a lot of the Bitcoin maxis sold to Bitcoin followers. And it actually upsets me because it's so obvious and the reason why, and again, I'm not taking anything away from Bitcoin. The majority of our company treasury is in Bitcoin. I want to be very clear, right? So I obviously, I, I'm a big believer in Bitcoin. I just want to explain what I'm not a believer in. The reason why Lightning doesn't work is because all payment flows that we have, let's say 99% of payment flows are one directional. So you get money from someone, you collect it one way. You pay your favorite hawker center here, mm -hmm. like for food, right? You go and pay the hotel, you go and pay the airline. You never receive money the other way. It's always a one way. 99% of our fund flows are one way. In Bitcoin, this is no problem. In Lightning, it's a problem. Because as soon as money or coins have to go out of a channel and they have to go into another channel, you need to settle back down to the mainnet. And so if you calculate it down, you can probably have about 300 to 400,000 people actually use Lightning for their daily work. Otherwise, you fill up the entire Bitcoin mainnet. 
yes, you can scale unlimited transactions, but that doesn't help you because all these payments are one way. And somehow you need to get the liquidity out again to reset because otherwise all your money is with Starbucks. And now how are you going to pay for the coffee? You need to somehow get money into the channel again. That means mainnet transaction. So you get this money in so you can pay Starbucks. How else are you going to... Starbucks is never going to send you money. So that's the main issue. Um, I'm still bullish, super bullish on Lightning, but not for retail payments. I'm super bullish for businesses who actually have bilateral payments, right? So a lot of businesses that do bilateral payments, banks, settlements. That's why I think PayPal, Strike, all these large businesses, I, I actually think uh, Lightning is going to be massive for them because they can screw Swift and they can screw SIPA and they suddenly have this instant settlement platform. I completely agree on that. I struggle, and then and, 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 and so you actually see this tendency. You look at the Strike app, right? Strike from Czech um, uh, Molnar, mm -hmm. who, yeah, in, in South America, he sells it as Lightning. There's zero Lightning about this. Zero, right? Everyone that uses that app is centralized. Completely. There's not even anything has to do with Lightning. So the way he sells Lightning is that on the back end, this app uses Lightning. That I completely believe. That I completely am sold on. So if I look at all that, I just don't understand how Bitcoin can be used as a, like a currency. I just don't see that. What I totally believe is when people say, oh, Bitcoin is a settlement network, 100% believe that. That's why I also think it's genius how Blockstream sold Lightning and then they add Taro in there, which has DeFi on Bitcoin. They add what? Taro, T-A-R-O, uh -huh. is like this application layer in Lightning for DeFi applications. And the reason why I think that's genius, because that allows for DeFi settlements, for USDT and so on, within Lightning. And that, I totally believe, has zero impact on the Bitcoin price, on Bitcoin. But I think it's really, really powerful as a value for the network. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, why do I believe in, like, why do I invest in Bitcoin? And why does my company have the majority of the crypto treasury in Bitcoin? It's mainly one reason. And that is because Bitcoin is the strongest brand, it's the strongest network, it's so difficult for any other coin to replace that thing. It's not going to be the top performer, but it has, it's a finished product. It doesn't need, any upgrade it has is optional. Anything it has already is fantastic. It's already there. That's what I, what, why I actually bet on Bitcoin. If you're asking me which coin is going to perform better price-wise, Ethereum or Bitcoin. Oh, Ethereum all day long. How, and it has. However, Ethereum has so much risk. What happens if Vitalik goes out there and has like a crazy idea, right? What happens if he says, oh, sorry, guys, we're not allowing the unstaking, right? There's no unstaking, sorry. Like, we changed our mind. We're all screwed. Like, in, in this very next instant, everything will crash. What happens if USDC or Tether says, oh, sorry, we're not joining the next hard fork. Like, we're going to do our own thing. Ethereum is screwed. You know what I mean? So it has, it, it's completely screwed. Bitcoin doesn't have any of that. And so that is why I feel from a risk perspective, you should always take Bitcoin. From a upside perspective, Bitcoin is definitely not the best choice. I think overall, the most important thing is both like a risk return perspective, right? You have to set, if you just go, you can't go only for the risk perspective or only for the return perspective. You always have to like set it into like perspective, right? Yeah. I think from a risk return perspective, Bitcoin is still the best because let's, let's say the currency is out of the room, right? Let's say it's not going to be a currency store of value. Even as a store of value, you have an upside of at least 30x. You like to I'm just yeah, match, disagreeing. match the gold market cap and Bitcoin is superior to gold in so many regards. Just like, okay, of, of course, gold has more adoption, right? And it's more accepted on more from more merchants and at more places in the world. That's it. But everything else, divisibility, um, censorship resistance, non, not confiscatable, like everything else, Bitcoin is superior. So let's just set it at the, the market cap of gold. That's a 30x potential for Bitcoin straight away. Completely aligned. And now looking at how many people in the world are actually holding Bitcoin compared to how many people are holding gold, I think the current valuation could maybe make somehow sense. But the upside, I still see a 30x at least for Bitcoin. So that would be like 500,000 US dollars. And for me personally, with the risk, default risk of Bitcoin is very close to zero for me. Whereas default risk of like most altcoins is closer to the 100% mark, right? Completely aligned, yeah. Uh, then I think Bitcoin is the best choice for sure. And a 30x, I take it every day and night. If I have to wait a few years for that, Dude, perfect. I'm completely aligned. Uh, and, and, and that is where I think people always 
misunderstand me or want to misunderstand me, right? Because they hear me say, oh, Bitcoin's not a currency. Uh, like there's, if, just a couple of things, right? If altcoins would spread the misinformation that Bitcoin are sometimes spread on, oh, we're going to see these bonds here. Oh, like don't trust anything unless you can verify it. But Tether, I mean, Tether, you, you should trust at face value. Oh, BlockFi, black box. Ah, like don't trust anything, but BlockFi you can trust at face value, right? That's what triggers me the wrong way. And and I always actually say, I actually have no issue with Tether. My only issue with Tether is that so many Bitcoin maxis just say, oh, trust it. That's what actually mm -hmm. scares me the most, right? Because I had the same issue with FTX where I had so many people that just said, oh, no, no, Alameda and FTX, that's all legit. Like, don't worry. Like, you don't have to look in there. Where everyone knew there was something weird, right? If someone would go out and say, like, Tether, I don't think there's, a, there's an issue. Is everything kosher in there? No, but I don't think we need to worry. They made it already much longer than I thought. I agree. Yeah. And now... I, uh, 2017, I was like, man, what, what is going on there? Like, this is... I, I'm still holding USDT, but they made it so much longer than I thought. And they actually, I think they had proof of funds recently, right? They, they... Yeah, it was like a, a snapshot thing. Yeah. yeah. I think now Tether is in my opinion, relatively safe because interest rates are so high. So they're making shitloads of money yeah. simply for being in dollars. Where a year ago, when interest rates were like zero, they just had to be so creative, yeah. right? So I agree. Like, I think the last 12 months for Tether were like the biggest navigating game ever. I think now Tether is really chilling and relaxing. It's like, yeah, yeah. Come, come for us. Like, we are as solvent as can be. Yeah. Do you think that crypto needs... I, to me, right? So like, I noticed so well um, in 2019, we had 2nd of April. I don't know if you noticed this well. 2nd of April, we suddenly had out of nowhere a 20% Bitcoin pump. And Bitcoin pumped from like just a little bit over 3,000, over 4,000. And that was actually the start. So I always say April 2nd, 2019 was the start of a very long bull run that went all the way until the end of October 2021. And then it got killed. Why April 2nd? I have no clue. I, I still think this was a very manipulated pump back then that kind of took it off. I still I actually I blame big green candle. I still blame Tether for it. Blame. I mean, I, I think it was Tether. Who knows? Do you think what's gonna what do you think is gonna be the the reversal of the trend right now? Do you think there is it needs one? Do you think it's just gonna like I don't know, there's just no one left selling. Everyone is like, screw that at these prices I'm not selling. It's going to come around. Well, that's how bear markets in crypto look usually. You have one big capitulation wick, right? And then you have like sideways slide upwards movement until we have eventually one big, um, one big pump towards the upside. It was in 2019 the case. Then I think in 2015 or so we had, we had also a pump like uh, similar to that percentage wise even more, I think. So usually this is how a bear market looks. And there we are. Th this is where we are right now. Let's say we have bottomed right now then I don't expect this big pump to come now like next week or so. We will need a few more weeks of like boring sideways action. But eventually, this is how a bull market starts. And this is what I think will happen. This is when shorts are getting liquidated, when all the people who are still betting, continuously betting on lower prices, they are going to get wrecked. And this is what every time happens. Shorts get liquidated, longs get liquidated. Um, the whole market gets cleared out, and when everyone lost money, this is when it can go up again. Do you think it's gonna be a? Uh, do you just just gonna think it's an inherent kind of like trend reversal in the crypto space? Do you think it's gonna be an outside trigger? Is it gonna be either or? If it is an outside trigger, what do you think it is? Do you think it's gonna taking all the way until Bitcoin halving twenty twenty four? Do you think it's gonna happen right next year? I mean, you said next year red a green candle. I mean, the, I think the next year's yearly candle is going to be green. That means that the closing price in December will be higher than yeah. the opening price in January. Um, what it needs is, once again, I think it's just time. And then we will, have, um, we will have news events supporting that. There's a famous saying, show me the charts and I'll tell the, you the news. So <laughs> I, I really think this is true. Oh. Whenever we are on the top of the bull market, this is usually when like, some news are breaking, one project failing, then the other one. And like, you can just overlay like the FTX bankruptcy and like everything Mount Gox over the charts. And you see like, this, they are all coming always at the perfect time. CME futures, right? Mm. Like directly at the Bitcoin bull market high. I think um, 
Of course, it's very difficult to say what's correlation, what causes what, is this causing that or this causing that, that. but um, I think it's just market cycles and the news are going to be feeding the narrative. From all the events that we've seen this year, which one do you think for you was the most surprising? Let's move FTX away because I feel, I, I, and maybe for you this was not the most surprising. For me, FTX was the most surprising. Which for one? Me too. Okay, which of the others? Luna, Three Arrows Capital, I don't know, suddenly all these entire like centralized platforms going bust. Um, was it, I don't know, was it that the Fed would be so aggressive that kind of caused such a massive kind of downturn because the dollar went up so much? What was the thing that you felt if it is like January 1st again and like there's a time traveler that comes back and says, hey, these are all the things that are going to happen. Other than FTX, which one would you be that you call bullshit on? Luna was a surprise, but only because I was not holding Luna. I didn't make research on it. Mm. I was not talking about Luna. When this whole thing happened, I talked about Luna. I asked people, do you think Luna is going to fail? Like on Twitter, after that happening, I talked about Luna. Before this event, I never promoted Luna. I didn't have Luna. So if I had researched it, I would have known for sure that it will fail. Because at it was some point, clear. you wouldn't have known when, but at some point. I, I, yeah. I, I would have known it happens in the bear market. Because yeah. eventually, if the market cap of Terra falls below the UST market cap, it has to fail because it's, it's, it's backed by it, right? Um, but at this point of time, with micro and knowledge, this would have been the biggest surprise. And from the financial, financial damage perspective, it was huge. Was it like $30 billion or $40 billion? I don't know. Like from the, if you just compare the market cap to FTX, the financial damage was probably pretty similar. So um, that, I think that was the second biggest surprise this year for me. Uh, Andres Antonopoulos recently in one of the videos said that he thinks that for crypto to kind of go into the right direction again for him, right, uh, there needs to be a focus more again on builders, people in the ecosystem, and less on like hype figures like Michael Saylor or like people who actually have zero to do with the ecosystem, but they kind of get evangelized as like heroes just because they buy something, even though they're actually not the ones who actually drive something forward. How I do think you see that a bit? Michael Saylor is actually not as bad as many people are saying right now. Yes, he's of course hyped a lot, but also he's not just buying, he's also providing education for other companies mm -hmm. who want to add Bitcoin for their balance sheet. I think fundamentally this is a beautiful thing and he helped the ecosystem a lot with that, even though the timing was maybe not perfect because now most of these companies are maybe not the most profitable. But I really think he helped a lot to bring Bitcoin not only in the mainstream where people like see it on YouTube and on like news and everything, but he's actually bringing also companies in, putting Bitcoin into their treasury. Um, whether this is as successful as he wanted or not, I don't know. But I think it was a great plan and it was a great thing to do. So people like him are actually pretty valuable. But in the end of the day, of course, we need people who are building and who are giving crypto a good name again. So I don't know, people like you and of course many others, people like CZ so far, I think he's doing a great job. Um, they are very important for the industry as well. And they are not only giving us good headlines, they are like driving us forward fundamentally, right? giving use cases to, to crypto. And I think that's very important. So whatever Andreas Andropoulos says, usually blindly I can sign what, sign what he's saying. He's like usually yeah. right. Mm -hmm. What do you think people, I mean, I know you in person, it's always a bit different. What do you think people that don't know you in person, that only see you on videos, what do you think they get wrong about you? Well, if they if they only see the title and the thumbnail, then for sure they get a lot of things wrong because they would think I'm just like screaming Bitcoin now, now, now in big letters with like emotional faces. If they then watch the video, it's probably getting already a little bit better, yeah. right? Because I'm a little bit more calm besides the introduction. And um, I think some people might think I'm just like uh, hyping things a lot and um, being too emotional. But uh, in the end of the day, I want to make my videos entertaining. And if I have an information to provide to people, then I want to make it appealing. So if you think about having beautiful chocolate pralines and you want someone to taste it, you don't put it into a boring, shitty bag, right? <laughs> yeah. You want to put the beautiful pralines into a shiny bag. You want it to make it appealing to open it. If you don't make that, people will not p touch this package and will not taste the beautiful prelance. So you want to make the, the, the packaging very appealing 
so the people can get a hold of the information you're holding inside. That's why I'm making these screaming thumbnails because I know by psychology, it's just numbers in my YouTube backend, the click-through rate is higher. So I wanna make the click-through rate the highest possible. I wanna make the impressions I'm getting the more highest possible so I can fulfill my purpose. And if that means that like 10, 20% of the people don't like me because they only watch the thumbnail or they, they make their opinion about me the, the fastest they can, then so be it, it's the necessary price I have to pay. I think that's something similar Elon Musk would say. He's very okay. controversial. He has some people who hate him, some people who dislike him, who disagree with him. But with the exact strategy he is going right now, he's reaching everyone. Everyone knows him mm -hmm. and he's, he's getting towards his goals much faster than going the safe way and going the way that everyone likes him. So it's not my goal that everyone likes me. Have you ever had your YouTube account blocked or any issues with that? Two times. Really? Deleted two times. What? Yeah. What happened? Both times I had an institution in my title, which starts with the F. No way. Yeah. And um, US institution that starts with F. Um, yeah, you know the yeah. institution, yes. Three letter word. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I had this, this in my title and I got my channel deleted two times. No way. So I decided not to talk about <laughs> <laughs> this topic really? anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first time I, so that was, I was the... like, first time I was like, okay, this is an algorithmical mistake. What happened here was 2020. Mm -hmm. I was in Thailand. How but the second your, time I saw the common channel? denominator. How big? How was the your first time was like around 50,000 subscribers, and the last time was in 2021 or beginning of 22. Also, really much bigger, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. The second time it got deleted. And there, the second time really? I knew the common denominator, Holy right? Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was... you wrote that to me once. He's like, dude, like, if you're using that, I, I still remember you sent me a message once, like, dude, like, be super careful. Like, you be shouldn't careful. be using that term. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. I was like, okay, hey, uh, I, I talked to Eval. I said, Eval, we need to adjust the headline just to be safe. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's I, I would not do it. Um, that's another thing, right? Uh, if you want to maximize your impressions, there were so many truths I wanted to uh, speak, so many things about like whatever happened in 2020, right? We yeah. all know it with the lockdown. So many things I wanted to openly talk about to, to tell people. But if you do it and your, your reach gets limited, no one hears you, right? Yeah, or your account so, gets completely banned or something. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who really get, lost their accounts and that's it. Exactly, so you, you, you have to be very careful. So what I did is I continued with my, with, my, with my content and I just made like sometimes stories at a party or something so people understand like I'm not freaking out about everything, right? And I, I tried to subliminally give people the message I wanted to give them. I think that was the best way because if you speak up on the wrong, on the wrong platform, in the wrong way, then you can lose your reach. What are currently, like, I don't know, what's a great book, what's a podcast, what's something you're reading, watching that you feel like is not, like, I don't know, it has not been discussed 6,000 times somewhere, but like you feel that this stuff that people should read or watch, a book, a podcast, uh, I don't know, something that you felt you got some value out of it. Creature of Jekyll Island, maybe. Oh yeah, okay. It's maybe I, I would say it's some other books, but they are like usually yeah, everyone already Creature heard about Jekyll it, Island, right? Yeah. But this is not. This is one which not everyone. Whenever heard I recommend about. that, people are always like, "Ah, oh, this is just pure like conspiracy theory," especially because in the last, in the later yeah. parts, it talks about like climate change and so on, right? And people take this super like personal, like, ah, like. It's also difficult to read. I have ADHD, and reading is difficult for me. This book is. It's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, and it's a long book, yeah. Yeah, but um, even if someone doesn't believe in this or that, it's at least good to like see a few different viewpoints so you can question your current narrative. Um, so I think even like I, I listen to conspiracy theories sometimes just to like question my, my current standpoint. And certainly many of them are completely weird and wrong. Mm like this reptile stuff, and I, I, I don't buy it. But at least I, I listen to it, right? I just wanna, just wanna make sure. Where's this stuff coming on? Why, why did I see this now about the Satanist stuff at the moment? I don't understand this part. Did you, did you see this, like how Satan, Satanists are taking over the world? And I'm like, why am I getting this on YouTube? I don't understand it. Yeah, so suddenly I, I, got... I didn't see it. I didn't get it recommended. Okay, maybe I, like, I don't know what I clicked that. But there that. are Satanists. Yeah, what there is that? Are. What is that? I don't, I, I don't know that. much about to me, this, this theory. Like, I was like, not interested, not interested. Like, get, get, give, yeah. get me away from that. Like, I don't care. Like, but I, what is that stuff? I, about this specific thing, I don't know. But I know that many of these theories also hold truth. Not all of them. That's why I have, I, like, 
you, you can't just blatantly say that they are all wrong. Look at Balenciaga. This is for me a 100% thing. You, did you see it? Yeah, there's what, what... This high fashion brand? Yeah, I just saw where this was with the kids, right? In this very questionable... Not questionable. It's a 100% for me. They had like a court filing about like pedophilia on the table while they had their photos or something like that in this. And then like some kids with a, with a teddy bear in like sex clothes. It was sick. There's like a hundred percent wrong. What's that? I mean, no I, one can I, say I honestly, I didn't it. follow it. I, I didn't follow it. Like I just obviously just saw it a bit on the side, right? And yeah. Chicken Genius, who's like an influencer here in Singapore, like I'm really good friends with him. Yeah. And like we talked a bit about it, and he posted about it, and I was like, what the? F yeah, I, I don't know exactly know how it fits into all the other things, but it definitely shows that a brand which has outlets in every single country all over the world has has leaders who are extremely perverted or like people who are in charge where some of them at least, I don't want to say something wrong, some of them for sure are perverted people who are doing a campaign like this. It's like seriously wrong, right? And these people are on the top. So there are like a few of these things coming out every now and then, but most of the time it's not as clear as in this Balenciaga case. Sometimes there's always a little bit of doubt and that makes these conspiracy theories so questionable because they are like built in a way that you can't really approve it. You can't deny it, right? That's what makes them so like. Yeah, well, I don't even understand why would they post. Like again, I didn't. I really didn't look into. I don't it. know why, like subliminal messages or something, or like just like living out that perversion. But but they did it, right? Yeah, I they did it. So now we just have to understand the intention. But they already did yeah, it. That's it's my wrong. So. That's my question. Like why why would you put this stuff out? This, I don't know. I just know I want to boycott them. Like this is what yeah, I know I, for honestly, sure, right? I have not even. Yeah, I had shoes from them and like a few things. I, uh, oh, I lost really? a lot of money on that. Now I don't want to sell it to anyone. I don't want to wear it. So what should I do? Um, but yeah, you're right. It's it's difficult to see the intention behind, right? And but clearly there is some network of people who are like having these weird perversions, and it's it's sad. Ah, right? full on. Yeah, yeah, full on. I mean, there's a, a lot of people, right? When you go into the, like the Jeffrey Epstein kind of story yeah. and you kind of dig that rabbit hole, where a lot of people say that this is, and again, I mean, I heard, again, heard similar things about that story now where they're like, this is just like kind of instrumentalizing, like testing, seeing what's accepted, what's not, right? With Epstein where people are like, ah, this is just really purely an instrument to kind of get dirt on people, to test what can go right, what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it goes down very dark rabbit holes. I just, uh, actually, I, I don't know, I, I really didn't go too deeper into it. So yeah. it's just like, uh, what's going on? Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, what's, uh, where are you off to next? What are next plans? Traveling? What are? Well, I just extended my stay here in Singapore. I like it. I like the food, uh, unlike you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to stay here a little bit, then maybe travel Europe, uh, go back to Dubai. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll see. Just a little bit of traveling and I want to travel less in 2023. Oh, really? But I will, I will do some German Christmas markets, I think. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll, I, I'm going to be in Europe all Christmas, so. Cool. Yeah, it would be definitely nice, yeah. It's the place to be. It's like nice to have snow and like the old Christmas vibes we know from our childhoods. Yeah. Get, the, get the childhood memories a bit, yeah. right? Yeah. So beautiful. Oh, man, that's really good. Um, cool. I mean, we went through everything that I had written down to kind of discuss um, any points from your side, any things uh, uh, that you feel you want to bring up, topics or yeah. whatever, or uh, did we cover everything? I just want everyone, especially people who watch this until the end, I want people to understand that Bitcoin is money, right? Bitcoin is being smashed right now. Everyone is talking badly about it. Please remember the reason why you are buying yeah, Bitcoin, right? True. You are buying it as a hedge against the current system. You saw already third world currencies collapsing, second world currencies collapsing. And I already said the next ones are going to be the first world currencies. You already saw the Great British Pound, Euro, all falling against the US dollar. Yes, the US dollar is the strongest. Eventually, it's just the last man standing. Fiat currencies have all an expiry date. Every fiat currency has an expiry date. It's, it's historically... No fiat currency has ever survived. If you have the supply completely fluctuating only towards the upside, this has an expiry date. I agree. And um, we are in Keynesian economics where you should usually print and busts and, and uh, remove currency supply and booms. We are only adding. We are only adding since 1971. And I think that's why 
Bitcoin has the biggest use case and I hope that people are not forgetting that. I know it's boring for like more than a year. I don't even think we topped out in, in October. I think we topped out in April at 64 mm. because it was 5% up while the inflation went 7%. So the second high was actually mm. purchasing power lower, lower than the previous yeah. highs. So the, the bull market is going on, the bear market is going on since April 2021. Uh, we're talking about one and a half years. And um, I think, in my opinion, it's a good time to go into Bitcoin. Of course, you might lose more. It's no financial advice, right? Invest what you're willing to lose. But I think Bitcoin is a great bet long term and we are buying it to actually escape the current system and to secure our purchasing power. And everyone who watched until the very end, please, please not take this advice, but at least listen to it and think about it. And... Um, yeah, make your own conclusions. I agree. And I just want to say thanks. Um, even in our own company, right? We have like grown adults, right? Who like, when they listen to you, they're like, oh man, I'm like, I love what Chris is saying. I'm like following every video, right? Like just when you came at the at a yeah. party, right? Like one of our team members stumbled to you. He's like, Chris, I'm your biggest fan. And then afterwards, like, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. I got to see my idol, right? So cool. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah. man, you know, like if you can do that to people, I think that there's something special and magical behind it. So man, really appreciate it. Thank you, man. I Thanks for dropping by and uh, yeah, spending the time here. So it's really cool. Thanks for watching. Cool. Hey, everyone, click, subscribe, like, share, comment. And uh, then see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Appreciate it.